Well, welcome, church. Thanks for joining us and uh, for, uh, for tuning in. How old am I? Tuning in to this podcast, uh, listening to this later. Thank you for being with us on a Wednesday night. I'm excited to be here with you. And uh, wherever you're listening and watching, uh, thanks for being a part of this. We're starting a new series, as Pastor Jim mentioned, called The Art of Being Unordinary. And I am excited about this series for a few reasons. Uh, I'm excited about the, the verses we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks, about uh, the stories and things that I think God's going to teach us. But the primary reason I'm excited about this series is because my wife, Pastor Amy, our family pastor, is speaking next Wednesday. Uh, church, you love listening to her. She doesn't necessarily always love speaking, but she knows uh, God always uses her. And so I'm excited to have her share next week. And so uh, don't miss out next Wednesday. And uh, we're going to have a great time hearing from, uh, hearing from my wife. You get to hear what I hear every day. She doesn't preach to you all the time. She preaches to me all the time. And so just kidding. Amy, I love you. Um, and so we're talking about the art of being an ordinary. Here's where we're going for the next few weeks. Tonight we're looking at a, a passage. I'm going to lay some groundwork for us in, in 1 Peter. And uh, we're going to talk about unordinary people. And then my wife next week, as I mentioned, Amy, will be talking about being an unordinary priest. She's going to be looking at uh, this idea and, and helping us understand the importance of prayer. And then I'll come back uh, after that. We'll wrap up our series together talking about being unordinary prophets, how you and I are called to reach others with the gospel of Christ and how we're to share uh, that good news. But think about that word unordinary. Unordinary. I don't know about, I don't know about you, but uh, when I was young, uh, I just wanted to be ordinary. Ordinary. I just wanted to fit in. Now, this was a challenge for me because uh, uh, when I was in fifth grade, I had glasses for the first time. Uh, and they weren't any regular glasses. They were like the enormous glasses uh, that filled up my whole face. And uh, they, were, they were huge, uh, particularly for me because another thing that helped me, uh, or rather hurt me, was that I was so small. I was this small boy growing up, and I didn't really, I don't think ever hit a growth spurt necessarily, but I was always so short growing up. I had glasses that were, uh, you know, three quarters the size of my head. And the other thing about me growing up that was very hard to overcome was I was intensely shy. So I was basically this, like, nerdy little kid who had giant glasses, who didn't like to talk to anybody. Like, this was hard for me to fit in. And then as uh, everyone around me grew taller, particularly the girls, I felt like, oh man, I am so short. And I, let me tell you, church, I tried everything to do to get taller. Like I would stretch myself on pull-up bars and have my little sister pull my legs down. I, I would try to put stuff in my shoes to make me a little taller. I would walk around on tiptoes. I would try anything that I could to make myself taller so I could fit in. In fact, I played uh, basketball at a small Christian school, and, and I, I made the coach— uh, just fudge the numbers a little bit, and he put in all the, the programs and the different athletic guides that uh, I was a six-foot basketball player. I was not six feet, still not, but for that one year of, uh, of high school basketball, I was a proud six-foot in title only basketball player, and it was because I was trying to fit in. But as I read this passage tonight, we'll look at it in just a moment in 1 Peter 2, what I find is that Peter is telling the church, telling believers, you are not called to fit in. You are called to stand out. You and I are not called to be ordinary. We're not called to, to blend into the world. We are called to, to be unordinary, to stand out from the crowd, and to do what God has called us to. We are called to be unordinary. Now, over the next few weeks, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be looking at two verses. And if you have your, uh, your Bible or maybe you have your phone and you uh, downloaded our church app, uh, click on the notes for tonight's message. You'll find the scriptures as well as some thoughts we have for tonight. But 1 Peter chapter number 2, and we're going to look at two verses tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 uh, and 10, and we're going to look into over the next few weeks how God's called us to step out, to, to be called out, to not blend in, and to be unordinary. Because let me tell you, church, to, let's be honest, the world doesn't need another believer that's blending in and not sharing the gospel or standing up for their faith. The world needs a, a believer that is called out, that is willing to be unordinary, that's not going to try to just kind of be uh, incognito and, and try to, you know, move around and really not do anything for the cause of Christ. The church needs to step up and to be called out. So here we have in 1 Peter 2, 
two verses that Peter writes, and here's what he says. He writes this. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. These are pretty significant names that God gives to his people. But then he says this. He says, you are given these names so that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he goes on to say in verse number 10, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You see, through Peter's writing, God gives the believer four special names uh, for them to be lived, to live out, to be called out. Now, we have to understand before we move any further the importance of names in the scriptures. You see, when a mom and a dad in the scriptures were deciding on a name for their child, it often, uh, they believed they were, they were setting the destiny for their child as they were born. Uh, and, and God took names so seriously as well. You, you see this throughout scriptures. Uh, for example, when God changed uh, Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, what God was saying and signifying was that Abraham would not be the father of a few, but the father of many nations. Uh, there's another kind of obscure story, perhaps, in the Old Testament, when Eli, the prophet that when Samuel was born and was a young boy at the temple, uh, Eli and his son Phinehas, they both died on the same day. Now, uh, now, on that day, another event took place where Eli's son, Phineas' wife, uh, had a baby on that day. And so she learns of her husband's death and learns of her uh, father-in-law's death. And so she names her son, get this, Ichabod. Do you know what Ichabod means? Ichabod means the glory is departed. So she's having this baby in depression and saying there's no more, nothing else to live for. Names were extraordinarily important in Bible times. Now, uh, I remember uh, when my two daughters were born, how agonizing it was to come up with names for them. Uh, you know, there were too many names for me had negative connotations. Maybe it was an ex-girlfriend. Maybe it was a mean girl who made fun of my height growing up, which there were quite a few. Uh, maybe there were some run-ins with people who had names that I just did not like. And, and it was really challenging to come up with the name Avery and then to come up with the name Valerie. Uh, those, were, th those were names that were hard to come up with, but when you came to them, they were special. They, they were names that, that meant something to me as we were thinking of uh, our daughters, as we were thinking of what God's going to do with Avery and going to do with Valerie. You see, God took special care in naming you. He took special care in giving us these names in this scripture. Now, let's be honest, I love my parents. I certainly do, but my parents did not take, at least I don't think so, I don't think they took special care in naming me. Or at least I wish I, I, I would have liked them to have some more care. For example, my name, Jeremy, means nothing. I'm not named after a grandparent. I wasn't named for anyone special. I was given a random name that my parents didn't even know a Jeremy in their own whole entire life. And so I was thinking about my, that my parents this week, about their, their naming me Jeremy. And, and they tried to find, I think in Matthew it says Jeremy the prophet, but that's not, Jer that's not the name of the prophet. It's Jeremiah. That's not my real name. My name is Jeremy. It, it means nothing. Mom and Dad, I love you. Thank you so much for this great name. However, my parents were ahead of their time because they named me Jeremy Keith. And so my initials JK, uh, my parents came up with, and I think they were literally just kidding when they named me. And uh, I just was so, you know, special. My name is not special. Thank you. But Peter knew the significance of names, by the way, because Jesus uh, renamed him as well. In fact, in Matthew 16, Jesus goes to Peter. Peter had just had this spiritual insight revealed to him by God the Father. And, and in verse 18 of Matthew 16, Jesus says to, to, to Simon at the time, And also I say, Simon, that you are Peter. And that name, Peter, means rock. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You see, Peter knew the significance of names. Now, the reason I share all that with you is because the names we're going to talk through for the, our last few moments together are significant because Jesus picked them out for you. He didn't randomly, like, you look like a Keith. Let's just give you that name. No, he, he created you. He, he uh, knew you. He formed you, Jeremiah says. And what he wants for you, church, is to know how special the names he has for you. And so I want to share with you four names we just read a moment ago in 1 Peter 2. 
And I want to give you a few thoughts on these names. Now, a couple of these names, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper over the next two weeks. But I want to share with you a few thoughts. Now, let's go back to 1 Peter 2, and let me read these names to you at once as we move into our, our notes. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and his own special people. Let's dive into these names and see what God has for us. Here's the first name that he gives to us. He gives us this name of a chosen generation. A chosen generation. Here's the thought I want to share with you, church, as you think about this name. You are chosen not for what you've done. You are chosen for what you can become. You see, you and I, we, we think that sometimes, and I may just speak for myself, but sometimes we think that we are God's gift to our job or our boss or our community or our home or our family. And sometimes we can get puffed up. And sometimes we think, yeah, God made a good choice with me. But that's not why God chose you. God didn't choose you because of what you've done. He's choosing you because of what you can become through him. And m many times we think that, well, God was so lucky when he had me. No, that's not the case at all. Many times you and I, we're not, we're not uh, thinking through what, what God's trying to do in our life. We're just thinking through of how it affects us. But really, when we think about this term, chosen generation, what God is, is really calling, telling us is that uh, this word chosen means to call out. So what he's doing, he's calling you out for his special purposes. You see, I love this name because it, it shares a common origin with all of us. You see, uh, you're not better than me, and I'm not better than you. All of us are sinners saved by grace. You see, uh, Paul tells the church uh, in Ephesus this way. He, he writes about this idea being chosen in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, when he says this. He says, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. And look what he says in verse 5. He predestined, he set us apart to be adopted, has sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You see, God chose you to be a son, to be a daughter before the world began. And again, this was not based on any merit. Remember, remember Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, it is for by grace that you and I are saved. It is through our faith, it's through God's goodness that we even can become part of the family of God. You were chosen not for what you've done, but for what you can become. You see, God's choices are a prime example of God's grace. Now, let me, let me remind us, and this is a simple spiritual thought, but just to connect it for us, there is nothing that you and I can do to gain more of God's love. There is nothing that you and I can do to attempt to put ourselves higher on the list of, God's, in, in, of God in heaven, like Santa Claus's naughty or nice list. There's, there's no list where like, okay, this is my favorite. God, God picked us, and so now we're a favorite. That's not how this is working. God chose us for what we can do through him in our future. And so God chose you to become what he wants you to be through his grace and his mercy. Church, you are God's chosen generation. But the second name that Peter shares with us is this, and, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more uh, with, with uh, Pastor Amy, which I'm excited to hear about next week. But he tells us uh, that we are a royal priesthood. Now, I don't want to step on Pastor Amy's toes for next week, but I want to share a couple of thoughts here as we think about this idea uh, that you and I are the royal priesthood. Here, here's what I mean by that. Here's the thought I want to share with you. You are given, and this is an amazing thought, you are given an all-access pass to the throne room of God. Now, now think about this. If you've ever had anybody tell you or make you feel as if you need to go through them to get to God, you need to tell them to take a hike. You need to like run away from them because there is nobody between you and God except Paul tells in 1 Timothy, Jesus. And so you have access to God as a royal priest. The, the priests, of course, and we'll look at this next week, that they went to God for the people and, and they made sacrifices and they prayed and, and they, they had a fellowship and communion with God. But really when Jesus, when he went on the cross, the, the veil, the Bible says, was torn, meaning that no longer do we have to go through someone else for access to God, we can go to God directly. Now it's great when people pray over us and for us. It's, it's incredible to partner with, with others in prayer, and, and we certainly reach out to and, and ask for prayer. 
but the reality is, is that you and I have this uh, all-access special pass to meet with God anytime, anywhere, any place. My daughter is going to kill me for sharing this story. I don't want to embarrass her, but a few years ago at Grace Fest, uh, Pastor Mark uh, gave uh, my family and I a few backstage passes to go meet uh, the band that was playing at Grace Fest. It was the band called For King and Country. So our family were so excited to uh, be back there and, and meet them. And, and I, here's a picture of us with meeting them. And they are very tall, because height is an issue in the message today. Very tall, but also incredibly kind. And, and as we approached them, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter, all of a sudden got like, she froze. Like they're trying to high five and like sh shake. And she just is like, I don't know if she was like starstruck, speechless. She just like froze and they're asking her name. She can't really like, she just is like stunned. And so they were amazing. Like they were like, is she okay? <laughs> like looking at us, like what, what's happening? But they like gave her a hug and took a picture. And, and it, was a, it was a really cool moment for, for us to meet them and, and really be encouraged by them. But I was considering this idea, you, as we uh, think about this all access backstage pass, you and I don't have to feel the same feelings of being frozen or, or uh, all this like, I don't know what to say, because God loves you. He, he, he created you. You were made in the image of him. And you don't need to freeze when you're ex uh, accessing and, and approaching the throne room of God because he will never leave you. Uh, this is what the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter uh, 4 when he writes this. He says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have a high priest who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So then the writer goes on to say, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. You see, you have this backstage, all-access pass to the throne room of God, and you can go to him anytime, anywhere, any place, and you don't have to freeze, be worried, because he loves you and he wants the best for you. The third name that we find from Peter uh, is that he now tells us that we are a holy nation, a holy nation nation. It's amazing to me when I think sometimes God uh, brings up topics that maybe we touch on or different pastors or different messages hit on, and it's the same kind of re reoccurring theme. For example, uh, the Lord really, probably about a month ago, has laid on my heart, we're in a series on Sunday called Compelled, and Pastor Ken started it many weeks ago. I'll be closing and wrapping up that series uh, in, a, in a couple of Sundays, and I felt the Lord calling us into Joshua, where we're going to talk about on Sunday being compelled to holiness, being compelled to holiness. And we're going to look at a story in Joshua that illustrates that. But what I want to think about tonight as we talk about this is that uh, your holiness is outsourced from God rather than manufactured by you. To be honest, holiness is kind of a negative word for both Christians and non-Christians. When, when a Christian thinks of the word holiness, too, too many times they think of an unattainable goal. They think of this idea that they have to be perfect. And, and we understand that holiness is an attribute of God, that it's a supernatural uh, act and, and uh, trait of God that you and I will never completely attain to. But we still work towards a holy life. And many times we, we feel like we fall short, so forget it. And then a, a, a non-believer, a, a non-Christian hears the word holiness, and they always think, well, that's a person trying to be holier than thou and trying to push me down to make them feel better. And holiness is a, a negative word often in our society today. But really when we think about this in the context of our verse, what, what Peter is telling the church, what Peter is calling the believers to is a life of holiness. A life of holiness. Uh, he writes in 1 Peter 1, just the previous chapter, he says this, But has the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. You see, you, uh, you and I are, are think, sometimes we think holiness needs to be uh, coming straight from us, but that's not really how it works. You and I can't be holy. There is not a holy bone in our body, if you will. There's not a way that we can manufacture it. Maybe for a season, maybe for a day or two at work or at home, we can appear like we're holy, but then we fall again. 
You see, our holiness is outsourced from God. And what I mean by that is, is have you ever been maybe at your company or maybe you've been working on something and, and your company, your office doesn't produce that. Maybe you're working in an office and you need to print some postcards for mailing and you don't print postcards, so you outsource that to a printing company. Maybe you're working in a warehouse and there's a particular part that you need for something that you're manufacturing. And, and that particular part, because it's so special, is outsourced from another one and they send you that so you can complete your project. Uh, many times we outsource things that we cannot do for ourselves, And that's really the idea behind holiness. We're outsourcing our holiness to God. We're saying, God, we are the vessel. We are your body. We are your church. And so you be holy through us because we're going to outsource this to you. Maybe, parents, you, you are feeling the effects of COVID with your kids not going to school, and you are ready to outsource those kids to a teacher to get them off of your back for a few hours, right? Like, we are ready to outsource our kids. We'll outsource our kids to anybody right now. We're like, please, someone take them. That's the idea here that we're outsourcing something that we can't take care of our own to somebody else. And that, in this case, is holiness. You and I can't be holy on our own. You and I can't, can't figure this out on our own. But through the power of God, through saying, God, I am a, a willing vessel that you just work through. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So check it out in, as we finish up our Compelled series. But we are a holy nation. You see, holiness is a mark that the disciple of Jesus shows. It's, it's not a burden for the disciple to bear. And so you and I, we are called to be holy. Here's the final name that God calls us and he calls you. He tells you that you are a special people. Now we're going to get into this in two weeks. Because God has called you to be an unordinary prophet. I love this word prophet, uh, particularly as it pertains to the scriptures, because the, the word prophet, we're going to get into this in a couple weeks, but the word prophet was, you could really kind of describe it as the, the mouthpiece of God. Uh, in the Old Testament, and we'll look at this uh, uh, soon, is that uh, God called a man who was the prophet, and he would go from uh, place to place, from town to town, from people to people, and he would proclaim the word of God. He was the, the mouthpiece of God. That was the way God communicated before we had the scriptures. And so you and I are still today called to be unordinary prophets. And here's what that means. It says you were made to be a mouthpiece for God. You were made, in verse number 10 we saw, we saw this, that you and I were made in 1 Peter 2 to proclaim. To, to Rather, the end of verse 9. You were made to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness. You see, all it means to be a prophet in, these, in this particular passage is this. To tell people what Jesus has done for you. To, to that, that dark place that you were in years ago. That dark place that God saved you from. Do you know what your responsibility is now? To go tell someone else about it. You are the mouthpiece of God. Now, now, now let me tell you, because we are in a, a politically charged time right now in our society, in a, an election year, in a pandemic year, you are not a mouthpiece for a political party. You are not a mouthpiece for a particular news channel. You are not a particular uh, mouthpiece for a particular social media feed. You are the mouthpiece of God. Don't, 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 don't uh, you know, desecrate God's call by, by you know, going down and, and dropping down into something God did not call you to. God didn't call us to be Republicans and Democrats. God called us to be followers of Jesus. And what that means is you and I are called to be the mouthpiece, to proclaim the good news. I, I read an article recently of, of, of a Christian writer, and, and he wrote a kind of a, a, a phrase in that article was, when Christians lose their mind, people lose their faith. And many times when I think about that, when we lose our testimony online or when we lose our testimony at the grocery store or at work, what we're doing is we are, we are deadening our mouth to be the mouthpiece of God. We are we're kind of muffling it. We're losing what God's called us to because we decided we need to be the mouthpiece for another news channel. So let me encourage you, church, to be the mouthpiece of God. You might be asking yourself, well, how, how do I know? A, a simple way is to look at your social media feed. Are, are you talking more about the political day, uh, things of today, or are you actually posting scripture? Because if, you, if you're posting more political thoughts than you are scriptural thoughts, you are not being the mouthpiece of God. Now, I'm 
not maybe stepping on your digital toes right now, but let me encourage you, church, for us to be the mouthpiece of Jesus. To be the mouthpiece of the gospel and of the good news. I, I love what we find here in Mark chapter 13 as we're wrapping up our time together. Where we write this, we hear this rather. It says, and it is necessary that the gospel be preached to all nations. We are called to preach the gospel. We are called to go out and be the mouthpiece of God. You see, you and I, we were, we were chosen. We are priests. We are holy, and so now our only response to all that is to reveal God's praise to a lost world. You, you could read, as we read a moment ago, that, that phrase, that you may proclaim. You could read that as meaning that you and I are to quote-unquote advertise. We essentially, what Peter kind of is telling in today's vernacular is that you and I should be a billboard for Jesus. That our life should represent, it should advertise, it, it should be a walking billboard for the gospel. It should be a walking billboard for the great things that God's done in our life and the great things he wants to do in other people's lives. You see, you and I, we are called chosen. We are called royal. We are called holy. We are called special. Don't let the world call you anything different. Don't let the world try to take away the names that God has given to you. Because these names, God wants to tell you, church, you are chosen. You are royal. You are holy. And you are special. So our response, church, is this. We're to go out into our world. Tomorrow at work, in your commute. Maybe on your Zoom call, students, as you're in school or Maybe you are uh, at the store getting a few supplies. Maybe you're posting online. Our call, our response is to proclaim the good news. Our response is to say, God, I'm going to use this mouth. I'm going to use these fingers as I type. I'm going to use this mind as I think. And I am going to proclaim you. I'm going to proclaim the good news because I'm going to be a walking billboard for Jesus. Now, you might be uh, listening or tuning in, as I said earlier, or maybe you're listening to this later, or a friend invited you, or you checked out uh, this uh, live stream or podcast or a uh, message later, and maybe you've never made that decision to be a follower of Jesus. And you're hearing these things, and you're like, man, like, I want to be uh, special and called and holy and royal. All that you need to do, the Bible tells us in Romans, is to believe. Uh, this is not, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our salvation or our, a call to forgiveness is not based on anything that you've done. It is solely based on what you can become. And you can become forgiven. But only as you put your faith in Jesus. Only as you accept God's free gift of eternal life. And you say, God, I know that I've done wrong. I know that I'm a sinner, but would you please forgive me? Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I receive that gift. Come into my life and clean me from the inside out. You know, it's, it's been amazing that we don't always know the effects of, as we're just talking to a camera, we, we know and we've seen uh, and heard of stories of people on the other side in various spots and places listening. But what's been amazing in this whole COVID season is that uh, while uh, we maybe are not physically seeing you, we know that spiritually God is working. God can work through cameras. He can work through voices. He can work through uh, me social media. He can work through a lot of various channels. And, and even this past Sunday, we had about a half dozen uh, people respond online. And, and they, they clicked a digital hand and they said, I want to say yes to God. We never want to get over that, that God's kingdom is still expanding right now. That you have an opportunity to say yes to God from wherever you are. And God calls you chosen. He calls you royal and holy and special. All you have to do is take a step and say, here I am. I'm saying yes to you. Here's what I want to do. If you're perhaps watching or listening and you've never said yes to God, I want to lead you into a simple prayer. I want to ask you to, wherever you are, you're not, of course, praying to me because I can't even hear you. You are praying to God who can hear you. And all that you're doing is acknowledging your desire to become a son or a daughter of God. The call is made to everyone. God is willing that 
all people would be saved. And so while uh, you're considering that, I want to give you an opportunity. And I'm going to lead you into a prayer that you can pray there wherever you are. You're not following my words because it's not a, a magic formula or, or trick words that you have to say and get in order. You are just expressing the faith that's in your heart. And so would you pray with me if that's your heart to say yes to God? Say something like this, uh, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I know that I've done wrong. I know that I'm a sinner. But would you save me? Would you forgive me? God, please come into my, into my life and clean me from the inside out. Make me a new person and help me to walk in your ways. Thank you for calling me, for choosing me. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.